My brother, could you give us a summary of what we discussed this morning? One second. So we looked at verses 1 to 9 and we saw three groups. You said Moses, the priest and the officers. Yeah. You spoke about the officers and you took us to verses 5 and 8 and you said what? So we saw that the officers have two subjects or two messages and we're going to see if they're different or the same. Yeah. Anything else from this morning's class? From this morning, anything else? Was, tell me, I just, want, just tell me when you're finished so I don't interrupt you. One second. So we expounded on verse 1, which was the story of Moses, you said? Yeah. And the, the diagram on the board is a, an explanation of verse 1. Yeah. Carry on. So, so Moses, where is Moses? So Moses is here and he's explaining the past. Did you say, how did you say it? He's comparing the experience of the past. So, so he teaches them about the past so that they can understand the future of what's going to happen. So he used compare and contrast by this diagram and we discussed how does that work. In Egypt, there's no physical war, it's God that's doing all of that, God is leading. But in the future, the people are going to have to work for themselves. Yeah. And what's that got to do with verse 1? What? what does that, how does that relate to verse 1? The words of verse 1. If you read verse 1, if we were to read it, I'm not telling you to read it, you've already read it. 
what is the issue in verse 1 that Moses wants to bring up this scenario? Why does he bring all of this up? What's happening in verse 1? What is he predicting is going to happen? So the Israelites are not as well trained and they're few in number. What are they feeling? So in verse 1 they're feeling fear. So he wants to encourage them that don't look at the, the training don't look at the weaponry, don't look at the numbers, because why? Why should you not look at them? Those three things. What about those three things? A bit more than God is leading them. You already explained the answer. Just want to, just want to give us one more piece of information about those three things. They're worried about them in the future. He's predicting that they're going to be worried. He says, don't worry. Why? Why not worry? Uh, you already said. Just want you to repeat it. Why not worry? Uh, because if God left them in, the past, in the past, what was the issue? How many issues did they have in the past? How many issues did they have? How many? So people have already got the answer. So I want you to get the answer. How many? Give me the three. Okay, so you've got the answer now. There's three issues in the past. What are the three issues? You didn't say that. What's the issue? What's the issues in the future? You read it out in the verse. What are the, th what are the three issues? What's the three issues? Want some help? Yeah? Okay, so one of them is the numbers. Yeah? Okay, so you do the others now. They're untrained, the numbers. What do they see in the future coming at them? Can't hear you? No, what do they see coming at them in the future? It's right, right in the verse. What do they see? Don't shout out the answers. says the word see. What do they see? And? And what is a horse and a chariot, my brother? They're few in number. They're not as well trained. And the, and the horses and chariots are what? The symbol of? That's the training bit, not as well trained. Weapons, superior weapons. If you're, a sport, if you're an infantry person and the chariot's coming at you, who's going to win? Chariot will win. 
It's a much more superior weapon. So, do they have the same problems in the past? They don't? When they're at the uh, Red Sea, how did the Egyptians catch up? They used chariots and horses to catch up, didn't they? Yeah, are they outnumbered? Are they as well trained? The Israelites, yeah, so the Israelites are not trained. Um, they're fewer in number and they don't have the weaponry. So it's exactly the same issue of the past. In the past, God sorted all that problem out with the plagues and the pillar of fire. But now he's not going to do it. So he's already telling them, when you go to war in the future, it will not look like the past. Just in case they're assuming that. In fact, they already know that, because what has he told them as soon as they enter into Canaan? What will change? Anyone? What will change when they enter into Canaan? In the wilderness, why did they keep on going to all these crazy places, sort of back and forth, wandering around? Why did they do that? Who told them to do that? They could just sat down in one place. Why are they moving? Why are they moving around? Who's guiding that? Who's guiding that? Someone said. In what shape or form? The pillar of cloud by day, the pillar of fire by night. That's, he's the one who's telling them where to go. They have a visible presence of God. When they're going to Canaan, that will stop. They have no visible presence. Yes? So there's no visible presence of God. And so he's telling them, when God departs from you, you'll be scared. And you'll be scared because you're going to be confronted with the same issues. And last time I helped you directly. If you'll be few in number, you won't be trained. And they'll have superior weaponry. Any other points that we want to, anybody wants to add from this morning's class that we want to refresh our minds about? We picked up a lot of things. I think we've covered most of them, but if maybe someone wants to explain it in their own words or we miss something that they want to add. So, back here, they didn't have any evidence, but now they have evidence. And what did you say about, pro did you say about providence? One moment. How long is this period? From here to here. How long is it? How many years? Time. How many years? 40 years. Sister Anne, how long was it supposed to be? Between the past and the future, it's 40 years. You agree with that? They've been in the wilderness for 40 years. How long was it supposed to be? Not sure? My sister? 11 days? You sure? So, they leave Egypt here 
and they go where? They go to Sinai. And how long is that period? How long are they there for? Not the time it takes to get there. How long are they there? How long? 40 days? They're in Canaan a lot longer than 40 days. Sorry, in Sinai. So a lot longer than 40 days in Sinai. A bit more than 50. Seven hundred? Okay, so you're, you're marking 40 days when he's in the mountain. Yeah, but we know it's 46 days, but it's 40 days. So he goes to the mountain, he comes back down, that's one month, 40 days, and then what do they do? They pack up and then they leave? Do they? When he comes down, what do they start doing? Okay, so they're doing that while he's on the mountain, but don't they spend quite some time constructing the sanctuary? They construct that at Sinai? Yeah? How long are they in Sinai for? Anybody? Sister Schneider? Yeah, you're sure. Come on. Sister Solange? Sorry? 46 days, a bit longer. My sister? And? You're not sure? Um. My sister? My brother? At the back? How long are they there? From when they leave Egypt to when they leave Sinai? That period of time. Brother Lawrence? Eight days? Eight or eighty? A bit longer than 80 days. Not sure? My brother? Yes, you? No? My sister? Miss Elizabeth? Sister Emma? One year? Two years? Okay, so... Sister Snyder? No? Anyone? Two years. Two years. You said that with confidence. Yeah? So we'll go for two years. You got something to read to us? Okay, so you don't have a reference there yet. You're going to find one? Yeah. Okay. Anyone got one? Exodus 40. Exodus 40, verse 2. Should, can, can I read that? Exodus 40, verse 2, verse 1. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, On the first day of the first month shalt thou set up, shalt thou set up the tent of the congregation. Verse 17. And it came to pass in the first month, in the second year, on the first day of the month, that the tabernacle was reared up. Are we okay with that? 40 verse 17, it came to pass in the first month, in the second year on the first day of the month. Is verse 17 and verse 2 repeating in lies? Is that the same event? Or are they two separate events? What are you saying about verse 2 and verse 17?
So verse 2 is when they begin to set up the tabernacle. And verse 17 is the end. So that would mean that verse 2, what year would that be? So the first day of the first month of the first year. Yeah? So that's 1, 1, 1. Is that right? So 1, 1, 1, they begin. That's verse 2. And verse 17, it's 1, 1, 1, 2. Is that right? Is that what you're saying? One year. And this is when they begin to do what? To begin to uh, raise up. Yes? And here they end um, the construction. No, end building. Yes? So I want to highlight that we've got the second year here. So we're in the second year. That's okay. Is there any problems with what you're saying? Is there any problems with what you're saying from your history that you know? What's the problem? So, the first day of the first month, no, leave the first day, in the first month, they're going to come out of Egypt. On what day did they come out? They come out on the 15th, because the 14th is the Passover. So they're already on, in Egypt on the 15th, on the 14th day. We'll say on the 14th day. So the 14th day of the first month of the first year, the beginning of their history, they're in Egypt. So verse 2 can't be that same one. So that would have to be the second year if you're going to do that. And then that would have to be the third year. But you know it's not the third because it's the second. So what are you forced to conclude? The relationship between verse 2 and verse 17. What year must verse 2 be? Because it can't be year 1. Year 2. So if you put year 2 here, then verse 2 and verse 17 are repeat and enlarge of the same event. Everybody okay with that? Maybe not. I went, first of all, are you okay with that? You agree with that? So you're just commenting? Okay, so, but you're okay with that? My brother, you okay with that or not? So you, all agree, you agree. And the point you want to make? Okay, so we'll do that in a minute as well. So we're here, and we've said it, someone just said it's two years, so now we're proving it. The, the verse 2 and verse 17 are repeating in large. They begin to set up the tent, and I think in verse 17, uh, it says it's all done in one day. If we're okay with that. So now we're going to go to another one. So we did. Finish the building, and now we're going to say they're going to use it. And which, where are we now? Oh, wait, there, where was the, this is, let me write that. Exodus 40, verse 2, and 40, verse 17. What verse do you have? Okay. Exodus 19, verse 1. So give us a bit of the story. They've arrived at Mount Sinai here. So that's back here then, is it? 
So we're back here. So I'll put Exodus 19.1 here. So it doesn't give the day. So we've got 3, 1. Okay, so I'm going to put X here, and I'm going to put 14. It doesn't say in the verse, but Brother William says it's 14 for some reason. Okay? Numbers 10, verse 11 to 13. And it, what, where is it? Is that right? That's when they leave Sinai. So that's about 50 days. Is that 50 days? It's ended here and it's the first day of the first month which would be 30 days and then 20 days. Is that right? 50 days? So they're only there for 50 days worshipping. Is that a surprise to you? You think it was longer? You're going to double check. My brother. Sorry? You're disagreeing with two years. Okay, um, so you agree with that? The third month. Uh, we'll read in a second, but do you agree with that? They arrive at Sinai. This is arrival, yes? They arrive at Sinai on the third month of the first year. Oh, just read the verse. Shall I read the verse? I'll read the verse. You can say, say 19.1. In the third month, when the children of Israel were gone forth out of the land of Egypt, the same day came they into the wilderness of Sinai. So not, then they might not be at Mount Horeb, um, but... They're in Sinai, the wilderness, and they've left Rephidim. We okay with that? Okay, and then 40 verse 2 we already read. Now it's the next year, the first month, so we're there. Then that's a repeat and enlarge, and then I didn't read Numbers 10. Let's read Numbers 10. Let me just read Numbers 10 and then tell us if we've done something wrong. Numbers 10, verse 11. And it came to pass on the 20th day of the second month in the second year that the cloud was taken up from off the tabernacle of the testimony and the children of Israel took their journeys out of the wilderness of Sinai and the cloud rested in the wilderness of Paran. And they first took their journey according to the commandment of the Lord by the hand of Moses. In the first place went the standard, so it explains how they, the sequence in it. So the order to march is the 20th day of the second month in the second year. So I think that's correct, isn't it? 22-2, which would make that 50 days. So what, where do you want to take us? You said a verse. Chapter 9. Numbers chapter 9, verse... Numbers chapter 9, verse 1. And the Lord spake unto Moses in the wilderness of Sinai in the first month of the second year after they were come out of the land of Egypt, saying, Let the children of Israel also keep the Passover at his appointed season. So where are we? We've got 1, 2, 3, 4, or we create a new waymark. 
Where are we? One, two, three, four, or somewhere else? Can you tell us if we're at one, two, three, or four, or are somewhere else? Based upon that verse. We're here? We're here? This is the 20th day of the second month. So the verse says, And the Lord spake unto Moses in the wilderness of Sinai, When? In the first month of the second year. So isn't that the first month of the second year? The day hasn't given, but they're given the month. So they gave the month, it's the first day of the second year. Are we okay with that? So it has to be, this is one. This is the same day. Are you okay with, so we're here in chapter 9. So in chapter 9, it's not given the day, but we do know something. What does it say in the verse? On the first day of the first month, what does it say in the verse? What did they have to do? Your first day... So first month of the second year, yeah. The first day, first month, first month. Sorry. What does the verse tell them to do? Don't help him. Okay, so it says, um, verse 2, keep the Passover. So give me the range of days it has to be. One, Two, day one to which day? What's the maximum day it could be? To, to fulfill this, what's the maximum day it can be? Three, the, the first, second and third day. So you tell me the number, I want to give me, the, I want to have the range. So tell me the maximum it could be when that instruction happens, what day number? What's the last day that could happen? Sorry? The third day. Why the third day? Why could it not be the fourth? So it starts on the 14th day. So why can't it be the 13th day he gives the instruction? Yeah, so the, he, the, the conversation must happen before Passover. So I'm asking for a range of days. Why you only stop at the third day? Why not the seventh day? Why couldn't he say this in the seventh day? Maybe I'm not understanding. Sister Earth? Passover lasts one day. So here we are. This is the first month. This is Passover, the 14th day. It must be somewhere here. So give me the first day. The first day must be the first one because it's the first month. What's the last one it could possibly be? That's all I'm asking. Can't be the 14th because it's too late. The 14th of Passover is here. So what's the last one it could be? 13th. Who, who agrees with the 13th? Sister Snyder? Why are you saying 13 for? What do you know about Passover? What's the last date it can be? 9th. The selection is on the 10th. The 10th day is part of the 14th, that's part of the ceremony. You can't go on the 11th and say, I haven't chosen my lamb. Do you agree with that, Brother Paul? Yeah? So it has to be here, so we've got the day even, not the exact day. So chapter 9 is going to be here. This was Numbers 9, uh, 1 and 2. So that didn't help us develop anything new. Uh, there were some voices here first. These 50 days?
give me the Bible verse that you're talking about. Deuteronomy. I didn't catch it, Deuteronomy. 2.14. Deuteronomy 2.14. And in the space in which we came from Kadesh Barnea until we were come over the brook Zered was 38 years until all the generation of the men of war were wasted out from among the host. So from Kadesh to Zerad is 38 years. So you're going to do 38, 40 minus 38, you're going to say 2. Is that right? If I understand you correctly. So that's where people are getting these two years from. And how long does it take to get from here, oh, what's happening here? This is leave, yes? Leave Sinai? Is that right? Is that what that verse was? Yeah? So from here to Gadesh, how, how long it is? How long is it? Someone already told us the answer for that. Chapter 1, verse 2. Deuteronomy 1, verse 2. These be the words which Moses spake unto all Israel on this side of Jordan in the wilderness on the plain over against the Red Sea between Paran and Tophel and Laban and Hazaroth and Dishab. This, this These are uh, the 11 days journey from Horeb, Sinai, by the way of Mount Seir unto Kadesh Barnea. Came to pass in the 40th year, in the 11th month, first day of the month that Moses spake unto the children of Israel. So this is 11 days. So what year is this here? What year is this? Second year? So this is the second year and uh, what month? That's the 20th of the second, and you add 11, so this will be the third month. Are we okay with that? So we're not going to look at the day, we've got, it's the third month of the second year, we know that. Numbers 9, verse 1. So we didn't go into Numbers 9. So you're going to go to 9, 15. I think I assumed it was going to be the same event, but now we're going to just proof text it. And on, the, on, 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 and on the day that the tabernacle was reared up, the cloud covered the tabernacle, namely the tent of the testimony, and at even there was upon the tabernacle, as it were, the appearance of fire until the morning. So, 9.15 is that event here. So 9.15 is Exodus 40.17, or Exodus 40 verse 2. Yes? The tabernacle is reared up. <coughs> uh, if you're okay with that, then what day is it? We said, we, when I rubbed it out, what days did we say it was? Day 1 to, day 1 to 9. And now what day is it? Day one, isn't it? Can we see that, my brother? If you go to 9.17, it has to be day one. Yeah, without even reading too much. Maybe we're assuming that it's all sequential and 17 comes after verse one.
but I think if you read it, you'll see that it would. It's this conversation that God's going to have on day one, and he says, uh, we're going to rear up the tabernacle on that day, and then in 14 days, on the 14th day, that's the tabernacle going to be, be reared up. So this is also on the same day. Everybody okay with that? Yep. Any surprises here for anybody? Okay, so from Egypt to Mount Sinai, people giving. I, I think my I think my artwork here was was not very good. I'm going to say leave Egypt to leave Sinai. That's what I meant. Not arrive. Did you want to say anything more? It, from when they leave Egypt, when they arrive at Sinai, how long is that? If I do leave Egypt and here arrive at Sinai, how long is that? One year. Is that what you're saying? Okay. What date is that one? I, I can't hear you. You've got to speak loud. 15th of the 1st, 15 one, 1 you agree with that? Okay, so if we read this one, we already read it, it says they arrived in the wilderness of Sinai on the 3rd month. You agree with that? So this here would be, we don't know what day, it's the 3rd month. So it only takes them, say it's the 15th, 60 days? Yeah? Oh, because you're saying it's the 14th. You know that exactly, yeah? Okay, so my brother's saying it's exactly 60 days, but it's only two months to get there. You're okay with that? So it's two months to get there, then they're there for um, nine months. Don't know what they're doing for nine months. There's this nine-month gap, then... What are they doing for that nine months, actually? Now, what are they doing for nine months? We do know what they're doing. Hisrema, what are they doing for nine months? So, we've got... 15th of the 1st, 3rd of the 1st, no. 1st uh, of the 1st, first, 1st first month. We'll just do the months. The first month and the third month. Then he goes up to the mountain for a month. What month are we now in? We're in the fourth month. He comes down and then what do they do? Basically. They begin to build. So if that's the fourth month, this would be the twelfth month. So there's two months here. There's one month here, and how many months is that? Nine months? Nine months to construct. It's just basic, it's, these are not, numbers aren't accurate. So they, this, this, this is the construction, then they rear up the temple on this date. We've got one, two, three verses to show that. And then, one month of actually having worship, and then on the second month of the second year, they leave. Okay with that? Any problems? It's not exactly one, it's not 30 days of course. So they're only there for 50 days. Where are They move from Sinai here. They leave Sinai on the 20th day of the second month. 
That's when they leave. And then it says in uh, Deuteronomy, one what? Verse 2. One verse 2. So it takes him 11 days to get to Kadesh by near. And then that's when things go wrong. So what we tend to do is, we tend to do something like this, which is where that two years came from, is we say two years and 38 is 40. Is that how we normally do it? So if you do that, then you can be, what you're basically saying is, because these dates are fixed, is that we're, we're, we're sort of saying that they do about a year's worth of worship somewhere. But the numbers actually just say they're doing 50 days. So uh, they arrive, they get the law in the next month, then they construct the tabernacle, it takes them three quarters of a year to construct, and then they're going to have worship for 50 days and then they leave. So it's quite tight. It's not sort of sitting around, perhaps like we might think. You think, what are they doing there for two years? So it seems that they're, they're only there for how long? One year. Yeah? The second year they leave. Sister Emma, you look worried. Yeah? Is that what you knew before? Okay. So we're all okay. They're there for, they're there for about a year. The first two months they were? This two months? Travelling from Egypt to Sinai. The Red Sea crossing, going to, uh, I think, is it Rephidim? They have a battle. They're crying and they're moaning. All of that prehistory, before they get to Sinai, it takes them two months to get there. Sister Emma? Okay, so maybe it's not 11 days. Maybe they're saying it should take 11 days, but it didn't. Okay, so the only reason we went there is because here, what did they receive? It's revision. It's just revision. What did they receive? Oh, did you find that passage you were looking for? That's the same passage. We, 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 we found that we put them down? No, that's the same passage. Same passage, yes. Yeah, so we already put them down. Um, what, what did they receive here? So, at the Red Sea, they separate from Egyptians, and what do they receive? What does Moses give them? Exodus. You can hear it over that side, they can't do fire. No. Deuteronomy is, is serving what purpose? They're here. What's the purpose of Deuteronomy? Okay, so what's this here? Okay, Exodus? Exodus 15. So this is the song that was going to lead them all through this history. So, here, <coughs> Patriarchs and Prophets, 387 paragraph 1, uh, you read, I'll just paraphrase. Okay, we'll stop there. So, 11 days after they leave Mount Sinai, it says Horeb there, did it? They leave Mount Sinai, 11 days, they get to Kadesh by near, so it is 11 days. 
Anything else? Sister Emma? How long were they in Kaidis Barnea? We know they're there for 40 days. So 40 days later, uh, you're in the second month. Say so if you got to Kadesh in the third month, and then it'd be the fourth month of the second year. Okay, do we have uh, anything about 38 years, or is that a math calculation we do? Unless anyone who makes a comment, I'm going to move away from this now. Unless anybody sees something that's of a value. What I wanted us to see is all this history, this song here in Exodus 15. And I'm going to take two years out because it's not two years. This is the song of Moses and it's Exodus 15. And that song is designed to take them all through this history. It was never meant to be 40 years. But it ends up being 40 years. So that instruction, if we were to read it, it will tell you your code of conduct in the wilderness. And then there is of necessity a change in law. Agree with that? There is of necessity a change in law. What Bible verse is that? Hebrew 7, over this side, which verse? Hebrew 7, there is of necessity a change in law. As you're trying to find the verse, if you don't change the law, what are you not allowed to do? Enter into Canaan. You can't enter into Canaan unless there's going to be a change of law. What word do we want to use? We don't want to use law, we want to use... No, that's the time period. We don't want to use law, we want to use a new law. We want to say a new, a new song. So there's a new song. There has to be a change in the song. We found the verse? This side, Hebrews 7. Hebrews 7 verse 12. Hebrews 7 verse 12 says there has to be of necessity a change in the law if you're going to change dispensation. So we know that there's a huge argument in our movement today about how dispensations work. So we're being accused of dispensationalism by uh, Future for America. I don't know if anybody here actually understands what they mean by that. They accuse us of following Mr. Darby and Mr. Schofield but that's patently erroneous, of course. Why is that erroneous? Why is it wrong to accuse us of that? Two points. The most important point. Why is it wrong, we did this in class, why is it wrong to accuse us of dispensationalism? Dispensationalism is a symbol of that doctrine. It's not just the word dispensation. So let's not get confused about false accusations. Let's keep true to what that symbol means. Why is it wrong to accuse us of dispensationalism or believe in Darby's and Schofield's doctrine? The number one premier argument that we have been falsely accused of is what? Okay, so it's a straightforward question, but the answer is not that straightforward. So that's why we're struggling to find the answer. The number one thing, if you believe in that doctrine, 
regardless of the details, let's not get bogged down in the details because the details already reinforce what we're teaching, is this. Before the end, what needs to happen? You need to have people converted. So there needs to be a conversion before the end can happen. Are we okay with that? End is what symbol? Close of probation. So by the time you get to close of probation, before that, what do you have to have? You have to have conversions. That's what their doctrine teaches at its core foundational concept. Is that what Adventism teaches? Of course it does. That's why we do so much evangelism. Because when we go to the world and we start saying, don't work on Saturday, what did they say? Oh, we agree with that, did they? Of course they don't. The world's going to say, you have to work on Saturday. And all the world's going to say, thank you. We're so poor, we like to work on Saturday. During the West, you get overtime money, so you like that. Everyone likes working on Saturday. You get double money in the West or in poorer countries. You have to work on Saturday to survive. So to convince people that it's wrong, they first have to be converted on the issue of Christianity. And do we teach that? Do we teach that? That they have to be mass conversions before Sunday law, before close of probation. Do we teach that in this movement? No. In fact, some of us have got such strange ideas that we think it's only a one-track issue with the nethonyms. Only one doctrinal truth. And of course it's not. That's what Elder Tess is trying to teach in her presentations. We've got five days to all come into unity on this issue. There are two concepts that have to be dealt with. First of all, the testing truth. The testing truth is what? The midnight crime message. Yes? Which says what? Treat people properly, equally. Everybody. The golden rule, it's that simple. Now you can do that without being an Adventist, can't you? For sure you can. You don't need to be an Adventist to do that. But that's not all that they need to learn. They need to learn some other things. We're offering them membership into the most elite club, aren't we? We call it what? The Church Triumphant. And any membership in an elite club has standards. We have expectations of our members. You go to a fancy restaurant, if you ever do, I don't, um, and they say, dress code. You have to come at least in a sports jacket, if not a suit. Yeah? You have to dress smart. You can't come in shorts or jeans. We all know that, even if we've never been to one. If you went to, if you went on holiday somewhere and you were sightseeing in one of these eastern countries and you wanted to go and look at um, the architecture of one of their temples, what did they demand of you? Number one thing, because they recognise what holy ground is, don't they? What do you have to do? You have to take off your shoes and you say, uh, not in my faith, you don't. We don't do that kind of stuff. What did they say? We'll accommodate you. Did they do that? No, they said, we don't care about your faith. It's our building. You follow our rules or don't come in. We don't care. So people from the West who have all these crazy thoughts about rights and independence say, OK, I'll take my shoes off. And if you go to a certain place, you have to cover your hair. They have all these scarves ready waiting for you. Cover your hair or you don't come in. And we're desperate to go and look inside, so we've we follow the rules. Yep, that's the essence of what Elder Tess is teaching. 
that this whole idea about joining this movement is not just secular equality. They're going to have to abide by all the rules. Should that surprise us? It should not. We did that, I think, in our first and second lessons, that you, classes that you did with me. What did we say? The Levites need to learn everything that we do because they need to be competent teachers. From the testimony of two things is established. So a Nethanim needs to understand all of those symbols about Nethanims, which means they need to understand everything we do. They can't understand that as secularists, as people of another religion. So they're going to have to change their religion. When does that happen? Before Sunday law or after Sunday law? Adventism teaches, whether they realise it or not, before. And that is dispensationalism. That's what Darby teaches. Before the end can come, you have to have all this mass conversion. Everyone has to be converted. And then when you're converted, then you can make your selection. We don't teach that. We say, because we follow God's word, Revelation 18 verse 4. Come out of her, my people. And who are the people? What do they look like? What do they look like? Do they look like us? They don't look like us. We can say it this way. They look ugly because they haven't been washed and cleansed. So when they come out, we say what? Hold on. Before you come, get cleaned up and then you can join. Put your proper clothing on. Yes? It happens then, not before. If it happened before, they would say, we're ready. What are we waiting for? The whole logic that Future for America have got is basically the same arguments that the church has got which are not fit for purpose. They're a wrong reading of God's word. Okay, so we've got 11 days. We've proved that. They're there for a year. So this 2 and 38, it wasn't my purpose to, to try and work that out and do the maths when it says the second year, which is actually one year and then inclusive reckoning, all of that, I wasn't trying to do that, but I think it's a nice line that we've created. Oh, yeah, it's um, challenges. Um, what would be the second year before? Two years. Okay. And did it one year a month. Oh, okay. So you was one of the people that said two years, yes. and now you changed, yeah. based upon? Based upon the instruction. Okay. Yeah. When we go to Trinity chapter two. Deuteronomy chapter two. That's 14. 214, where do we have 214? Here it is, 214. says what for you? Deuteronomy 2.14 And in the space which we came from Kadesh uh, unto Zerad was 38 years until all the generation of the men of war were wasted out from among the host. Yeah, so here they spent 38 years and uh, like, and they're going to, like, the storm is going to be written in the space of some months and then when you add that month to the previous month before It'll give you two years. Okay. Are we okay to move on? All I want us to see is that you need a song for this dispensation and you need another song for the next one. Okay? So I want to point out another thought. We're in Deuteronomy 2.14. What has God been waiting for? Give you a choice of four things. Children, women, men, or, uh, it's not here, let me give you the thing, or, um, or H3627. Is God waiting for children, women, Men, or H3627, what's he waiting for? What's he been waiting for all this time? Which one of those four? One, two, three, or four? 
Miss Elizabeth, which one has he been waiting for? Tell me the number, one, two, three or four. Number one is children, women, men or H3627. They're your four choices. Which number you want to go for? No, only what you've got four choices, just two's one. Number three. Number three. Or the last. I know you've got to go one or the other. You've got to choose one. Doesn't matter if you're wrong, but go for one. Just give me the answer, not why you give me, not the why your reason. The, the age. Didn't give any ages. I just said children, women, men, or age 36, 27. That's all I said. H. Oh, not age. H. H. 36, 27. The Hebrew word 36, 27. Which number? Number three. Anyone else? Sister Beatrice, which number? Number three? Sister Dorcas, which number? Not sure? My sister, which number? Not sure? You don't know what the question is? We're in chapter 2, verse 14. I'm saying God has been waiting a long time and what's he been waiting for? So I'll give you a choice. He's waiting for children, women, men, or age 3627. Which one's he waiting for? One, two, three, or four in that order. Number four. My sister? Not sure? My sister? Number two? Have you been waiting for the women? Wait for the children? Have you been waiting for children? Number one? Number one? My brother? Which number? Number three? Which number? Four. Number four? Number four? Number three? That's not number three. Number three was men. Number four was that one. Which one? Number three? Number one? Okay, so it says in the verse, what's he waiting for? Give me the rule number one word. You're going to use rule number one, what word? Brother Benjamin, what word? No. Sister Schneider. Not sure? Brother Rogers. 2.14. We'll keep up, we're moving fast. Three? No. Brother Dennis. It gets so far, I don't even remember what that question is. Just give me the answer. I don't remember what the question is. Don't worry about questions. The question is, God's been waiting. Give you four choices. People have got all different choices. And so now we're going to explain why three quarters of those choices are the wrong ones. So many of us have got the wrong answer. But now we're going to say, what was the wrong answer and why? So now I'm asking, what was God waiting for? We're in 2.14. Before we do that, I'm asking what is the key word, rule number one, the most important word in our study? 214, yes. Nope. Wasted. Wasted means what? Dead. What's he been waiting for all this time? To kill people or for them to be killed themselves through old age. He's been waiting, waiting until everyone dies. We agree with that? Okay, so who dies? The children, the women, the men, or age 36, 27? Which number? One, two, three, or four? Read the verse, it tells you, Sister Beatrice. Who's been waiting for? So everyone is dead. One, two, three, or four? 
Three, you sure? That's number four. You've got four choices. Children, women, men, and this one. You don't know what that number is? We did that yesterday. Ah, we've got to bring a yesterday study. If I, gave, if I told you what that was, I'd give you the answer. I didn't want to do that. Okay, so what we'll do is, there are too many people that lost, I'll give the answer, then we'll go back and see how we got the answer. So it says in the verse, what's he been waiting for? The men of war. So, is this a man of war? No, he's just a man. Age 36, 27. What? Oh, what, have I got the wrong number? Ah. Oh. That's why he's not working. I didn't check carefully. Naughty. Okay, give me the number then. That's better. 13, nine, is that right? Okay, now we all can get it right. I'm sorry, I apologize to everyone. I just looked at the number there and I didn't check what the definition was. Okay, so now we're all, we're, we're all together now. It's quite, it says right there, pertaineth, and I'm doing something else. Are we all on? Are we all together now? Okay, so the verse says God waited for everyone to die. Die is the key word, that's what he's been waiting for. And he waited for the men of war to die, which was this one here. Primary definition is what? What, word, what phrase did we use? When we, when we say we had two options, so one was generally and one was properly. properly and we changed properly into? Most the most correct. So the most correct definition of this is uh, we'll put soldier, it's not the proper definition. We'll put man of war. So he's been waiting for the men of war to die. Yes? We okay with that? When we read it, what do we normally say? All adults, all men, everyone, men, women, everyone, all that generation all dies. But what does the verse say? The verse says the men of war. So I'm not saying that the men of war and the men are different in real life. But I just want to point out that it mentions men of war. This is Deuteronomy 2.14. And in Deuteronomy 2.14, when it says men of war, it has men, one word, and war, two separate words. Men of war. Wasted means to come at an end. So, he's waited till all the warriors die, basically. So, I want us to uh, remember that point in our study as we start thinking about Deuteronomy 22, verse 5, and then also the issue of Deuteronomy 20. Let's come back to uh, chapter 20. Let's summarise. What God has waited for is by the time you get to the 38th year, all the people that were in rebellion have all died. That's what he's waited for. He's waited for them to be wasted. Wasted means dead. And the people that he's targeting is this fourth group, the men of war. Not the children, 
not the women, not just men in general, it targets men of war. So I'm just using that as the symbol, not arguing that you've got soldiers and you've got farmers in the two separate groups. I'm not making that point. We've already discussed that, that we have a militia and essentially everyone is a man of war. Yeah? Especially when we start defining what the qualifications of being a man is, because there's some age restrictions. At a simple level, we'd say 20 perhaps. Yeah? You become a man when you're 20. When you're 20, that means if there's a war, you become a man of war. Everybody okay with that? So, back to chapter 20. All the people that I confuse, I apologise because of that Hebrew word. Um, besides that, do people understand? Does that make sense now, my sister, what God was waiting for? He's waiting for all of those warriors to die before they could enter into the promised land, according to the promise. And only two people survive, Joshua and Caleb. And they survive because of their faithfulness all the way back here at Kadesh Barnea. Yeah? Okay. So, let's see if we can do Deuteronomy 20. Verse 2 says, the priest shall speak. Verse 5, it says, the officers shall speak. So let's go, we've done the priest one, and now we're just going to do what the officer says. The officers shall speak in verse 5, and then he's going to speak again in verse 8, and once he's done that, everything's finished in verse 8, because by the time you get to verse 9, it's all done. He's done speaking. Everyone okay with that? The word officer means what? In English, what does officer mean? An officer that doesn't do anything. What do we call him? He's military, but he has a, a rank. What, what do we call them? Officers that don't do anything. Don't get their hands dirty. General, yeah? This would be a general normally. Let's go back and see what it really is. Because he's not a general. We're going to use Strong's and Brown Driver Briggs. They're both half right. We discussed what that meant. For okay? So we're in H7860. Have I got the number correct? Yeah. I want to make sure I get it correct now. Okay? We'll drop down to verse 8. Is it the same word? Yes. And verse 9, the same word. 5, 8 and 9 is the same word. 7860. In the phone apps, it's all the same? Yeah. We're all good? Okay, so let's go there and see what it says. We'll go to Brown Driver Briggs first. Official officer. That's all it says. It's a masculine noun or it can be a verb. It can be something that someone does. A person does some official work. That's the, what he does, the verb. Or it can be the person itself. Yes? An official noun does official work, verb. Everyone okay with that? Strongs. So it talks, talks about an active participle. An active participle of an otherwise unused root. So there's a root word which isn't used, and this is an active participle. Don't ask me what an active participle is doesn't really matter unless someone's got a good working definition of what an active participle is. You do? No? Okay. So none of us know grammar. We can, we can Google it and find out. You get different types of participles, passive and active. This is an active participle of an unused root. There's a root, no one uses it. They take the active participle of that 
and this is what you get. And it means what? It means to write. And then our, I don't want to say this, I say it in a cheeky way. Prop, uh, sorry, then our favourite word. Properly. So this is the proper definition of the word. It's not a general, it's a what? It's a scribe. The proper definition, properly, which means the most, the most correct way to look at this word is a scribe. That is, by analogy or implication, an official superintendent or a, which is a, which is a judge. Everybody okay with that? What did the King James translators do when they found this word? 70, 78, 60. They said this Hebrew word, we will call it what? First one, we'll call it officer. Then we'll call it... Uh, 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 they don't call it scribe. Scribe is what it is. They call it... Overseer, look at the, look what the Strong's tells you. They chose the word officer, they chose the word overseer, and they chose the word ruler. We can see that. They're the three English words that 7860 was translated into. So if you go into your Bibles and typed in H, 7860, you'd find it, it says here 25 times. Sometimes it would be ruler, sometimes it would be overseer, and sometimes it would be officer. We okay with that? That's not the definition. The definition is what? The, the most proper way of saying it, or the most correct way of saying it, is a scribe, which by analogy or implication means a magistrate or a superintendent. What's that? I'll give you a choice of three. Religion, military, or state. Which one of the three? That's state, isn't it? It's the government. Religion, government, or army. This is government. So we've got church and state perspective. We're okay with that. This is not a military perspective. Any questions? No questions? Everyone good? Okay. So these people are leaders, civic leaders in the church, and they're going to make two statements. Statement number two, verse eight. The officers will tell the people, if any man is fearful and faint-hearted, repeat and enlarge, Fearful and faint-hearted, let him go and return to his house. And, tells, and it tells you why he should go to the house. So he doesn't disturb everyone else. We're 20 verse 8. Everybody okay with that? What has the prophet just, the priest just told him? Sorry, not the prophet. What did Moses tell them? What did the priest tell them? That he says they should not be afraid. And now he's acknowledging, if you want to disobey, if you don't want to have faith in Moses, if you don't want to have faith in the priest, then go home. We don't, want any, have, we don't have anything to do with you. So they're kicking him out. Yes? He's been isolated, put to one side. No, obviously not good. This person doesn't have faith. He doesn't believe in line upon line, doesn't believe in Alpha and Omega, compare and contrast, juxtaposition, beginning and end. He believes in none of that methodology, so he's not allowed to do what? He's not allowed to fight if he doesn't follow the rules. Yes? If he doesn't listen to Moses and all these rules, he's not allowed to fight. Any questions?
king is giving them a certain methodology. He is telling them the reason why they should not fear is because they have past history. And by looking the past, they should be able to see the future. So that could mean in verse 8, if there is someone who is going to fear, therefore he has not used this concept that Moses gives in verse 1. Look at the past to have confidence in the future. So, therefore, those, those who do not, all those who will fear when they go to war, could they have failed the, to recognize the methodology that Moses has given in verse 1? And maybe this could be the, okay, yeah, the question is, those who will fail to go to war because of fear, can we say it's because they do not respect what Moses said in verse 1? They do not have confidence in, in the, the concept that he gives past is going to give us confidence of the future. Yes. I think that's what we're suggesting, that this person in verse 8, he does not believe Moses. And Moses says, look at the past, so you have confidence in the future. And when he looks, all he can see is what? The future. All he can see is three things. He can see that he's outnumbered. He can see that he's not trained. And he can see that their weaponry is advanced, more advanced than his. He's got a pitchfork and they've got a chariot. And it's, there's no competition between the two. So in order for him not to be fearful, he has to trust in Moses. In order to trust in Moses, he's not just believe the prophets and you shall prosper. So this sort of like feel good idea. Moses is giving them methodology of why you can trust in that. So he doesn't trust the methodology. So this person's fearful, faint hearted. 1 John 4, 18 says what? Without looking. 1 John 4, 18. No one knows? Don't have to turn in unless you want to. Perfect love casts out, cast out fear. So this person does not have what? It says, because fear hath torment. He that feareth is not made perfect in love. So this person doesn't have love. Where? In their heart. Yeah? They don't have love in their heart. If we say, what, what's supposed to go into our hearts? We don't say the love, love goes into your heart. What goes into your heart? The law. So they don't have the law in their heart. If we go back to trying to understand what law means. What is law? It can mean many things. One of the things it can mean is what? Law is, in our study, song. They don't have the song. Which song don't they have? Two songs. They don't have the Exodus song, which was the Alpha, and they don't have the Deuteronomy song, Exodus 15, Deuteronomy 32. They don't have either songs which was the Omega, don't have the Alpha song or the Omega song. They don't believe in Alpha and Omega. You need both songs to know and have confidence. They don't have that song in their heart. They haven't memorized it. They don't believe it. They don't trust in it. So that's why they're fearful. That's why they're being tormented. Okay, are we okay with that? Verses 5. We haven't done those ones yet. We'll do those in a minute. Let's just, I, I wanted to do verse 8 first. Because verse 8 is a singular issue, well contained, easy to deal with. It's easy to deal with because this is the same issue that's going from verses 1 to 3. It's all about fear. Anything else? All good? We're okay with the logic? You're fearful. It means you don't have a love for the truth. It's not in your heart. You're tormented. You don't have the law in your heart. That means you don't have the song in your heart. You need both songs. The Alpha song and the Omega song. Are we all okay with that? If we're okay with that, we'll just make one more point, then we'll close. How many issues is the religion or the church dealing with? 
How many issues? Shout out number. Who shouted out? Someone shouted out something. Or did no one shout out anything? What, shout out the number. The church is dealing with three issues. Name the three issues. No, if it's three, you know the three issues. You don't need to read the verses. Just shout out the three issues. Sorry? Just a short word. Number one. The church. The church. What's it saying? No, it doesn't say that. Church. How many issues? No, what's the church saying? One issue, which is what? Fear. The church only cares about fear. What's the officer care about? Number two. Verse eight, what does he care about? Fear. Religion doesn't care about any issue except fear. The state cares about two things. It cares about fear and one more. The one more, which we'll do in our next class, is verses five to seven. I want us to notice that religion does not care about these issues. Does that make sense? Religion only cares about one issue, fear. And that fear is a statement about what? About what you care about. You care about God or you care about... You care about God or you care about... Not man. You care about yourself. You either care about God or you care about yourself. That is all religion cares about. You're going to be tested on one issue. You're going to serve God or you're going to serve yourself. The state is going to deal with that issue as well. You either serve God or you serve yourself. And he says, if you serve yourself, what are we going to do? Kick you out. We don't want anything to do with you if it's self-service. This is what the state says. It's going to say one more thing as well. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we ask and pray that you would guide, direct and bless us in the meditation and study of your word. Help us to gather in these thoughts as you open up your word, not only to give us a surface understanding of what these thoughts and ideas mean, but a deeper understanding, not only that we might get on the right side of the argument, but that we might have a corresponding, ex corresponding experience that will change and mould us to be the people that you desire and want us to be. That we could be the church triumphant. We have this privilege, we have this opportunity in these closing days, weeks and months before our next dispensation. May each of us decide not to falter, not to fail you. There are so many voices outside and inside this movement who want to distract and turn us into a different path into the wicked world below. The only comfort and assurance we have is if we meditate and study upon your word and we all come into agreement on what that word teaches. May this be our purpose and may this be our desire in Jesus' name.